Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here with Sanjay Torre, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio. And Sanjay, you know how much I love Mondays because I get to hear all the exciting things that you have done this weekend. That's crazy. I was actually <laughs> just thinking about it. I'm like, I had a really lazy like, A lazy weekend. weekend. <laughs> Usually, this is just for the people in the room. This is Sanjay's last probably four weekends. Uh, Africa, New Orleans, D.C., yeah. Boston. This, she's like every weekend, she's going somewhere else. Um, I try to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so there was nothing? Nothing you were, at all. You, stay, really. you had a staycation? Yeah, the, exactly. Did you go eat somewhere? I actually did. I went to um, Char. It's a Korean bar and grill. Yeah? Yeah. It was really good. Shout out to Char. Yeah. We'll send them an invoice for this. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a quick it out. All right. Well, you know, me and Stone, we were in Orlando for PodFest 2019. We were speaking at that event, and it was a lot of fun. We got to meet a lot of podcasters from all over the world, really that are independent podcasters that are, you know, just trying to figure things out. Yeah. It's and good I see stuff. that was really beneficial for you guys. So that's Absolutely. Awesome. Met a lot of interesting people. Met the guy that produced Tim Ferriss's first podcast. Wow. wow. So it was cool. <laughs> All right. So it's not as cool as what we got going on here. We got a great show today. We got uh, the folks from Prize Picks and the folks from Inflection Point Communications. And we will start with Prize Picks. Welcome, Johnny and Gurov. Close Gorov, enough, yeah. right? Gorov. Okay, so which one of you two? Johnny, you're the, the ringleader of this? I guess so, so to speak, of this operation. <laughs> All right, so tell us about Price Picks. How are you serving folks? Yeah, so Price Picks is a, uh, we're a new daily fantasy sports provider here based in Buckhead uh, at the Atlantic Village. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're just trying to do is really simplify the, uh, the whole fantasy game. At the end of the day, you don't have to go and create lineups. It's just you versus the house, just going over under on player point projections. And, you know, we cover all different sports from baseball to NASCAR to esports, and just trying to find the best way to, you know, simplify the daily grind that people just want to have some extra action, enjoy their games and not have to go through, you know, the, uh, the hours that it takes just to create a lineup, just to end up losing in the end. And then the, so the object is just over under in points. Yeah, so we uh, we create fantasy point projections based on the different sports that we run. Uh, we have our own scoring system that we use, and then in-house we create projections based on what we think the results will be. And all the people have to do is just basically log in and then say if they think that you know we're smart or not and tell us if we're doing our mm -hmm. jobs, and they go over under on those. And then obviously if they get them right and then we're wrong, then they win and everyone gets to have a good day. And then uh, so – this is rolled out only here in Georgia, or this is international? Because uh, aren't the rules current, different now? So the rules have changed. The landscapes, I mean, it actually has improved for us since about 2015 when there was a lot of Supreme Court rulings that were mm -hmm. kind of made the uh, the fantasy industry kind of a very big gray zone to operate in. At the end of the day, we are currently legally operating in 30 states and provinces in the U.S., uh, D.C. being one of them. And Georgia is obviously being our hometown state. That's where we're really focusing a lot of our efforts. And currently, it sits as a gray state on the fantasy scale, so... It's what does that mean, gray state? Basically, there are no rules or regulations saying we cannot operate it here, but there also haven't been a law put in place saying that we're technically allowed to operate here either. So, so some states have laws that say go for it. Yes, some states like Colorado, Arkansas. Um, there's, I mean, there's a good handful of like five or six states that you can go get legal licenses for. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only a few that we're currently concentrating in, just from a business strategy perspective. New Jersey is now, you know, a big, you know, legalized sports gambling state, but there's nine major players trying to hit New Jersey who have the same population size as the greater Atlanta area. Right. So we're going to, you know, own our backyard day one. And then from there expand out to other, you know, regions like Florida, Texas, and California. Now, what is the profile of the fantasy sports person that actually does this on a regular basis because that would be different i guess than the casual person that is well that's actually kind of the beauty of our game is that we kind of want to focus more so getting those casual players that are just looking for just a little added extra entertainment because their season may be not going as well on their season long side or it's just they only play football season long but they you know they're also basketball fans they're baseball fans they don't have a season long team so this mm -hmm. just gives them that added incentive to just enjoy every game that's going on and not have to just be the only the, the team that they care about and then typically how much are people betting on a given game or uh so in we have like a ten dollar minimum entry amount so that's like obviously the lowest that you could come in at but uh we currently max out at a hundred dollars just because at the end of the day 
we want people to enjoy the game. We're not trying to necessarily make this into more of a, a vice that people are, you know, using their entire paychecks to go after. You know, we want this to be something for people to have added value, not to be their whole life. Basically. So it's geared towards the casual player and in a way to make it fun, like somebody that would go to bingo or somebody that would just do these kind of exactly. casual things. Not this isn't a lifestyle yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, there's people out there who are out creating algorithms and they're running giant <laughs> spreadsheets and they're creating, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. to thousands of unique injury, injury entries each day. They're kind of honestly treating it like the stock market and right. they make it almost a day trading when it, within the fantasy space. So with us, though, we're trying to make it more just as you're saying for the casual fan that just wants to spend five minutes to go make a few entries and have a chance to. Win right. And that way, then we're, they're watching the game with their buddies and then they care a little more. Exactly. Like I could, you know, not care about the Lakers doing well, but I happen to have LeBron mm -hmm. going over. So I really want to see LeBron do very well. So I so I do over and under in the game itself and I can pick individuals. Yeah, so the game is all based around individuals. So we have, to be a fantasy legal contest, we have to have at least two players from two different teams offered. So that's the minimal viable entry we can have. And so as long as we have those parameters covered, then you can enjoy the game across any sport you want to. And then, um, so like if I'm watching the Lakers, so I have LeBron and I have another one of their players, and I think that LeBron's going to get more than 28 points, then that's my $10 bet or whatever my bet is. Yeah, so it would be based on the fantasy points, so it would be a totality of all the stats. That so it's not just involved. scoring. It would be the algorithm that can include scoring, turnovers, pass, uh, assists, rebounds, rebounds. Yeah, blocks, all of those. Mm -hmm. So they all go into play for it, and then, yeah, obviously you would have to then have one other person from either the team that he was playing or another sport that was going on that day or that night and just to make sure it was you know a viable entry at that point. Mm -hmm. But can I also do the team, like I think the Lakers are going to get more than X number of points? Not with us. I mean, so you can find, in, you know, the there's other games that do that. Yeah. I mean, right now if within the state of Georgia, the only place you'd be able to do that would be with like an illegal offshore bookie at the end of the day. Okay. So fantasy and picking a winner or loser is a different thing. Exactly. So fantasy is about individual players. Mm -hmm. And then like gambling is about betting on winning and losing a game. Full teams. I mean, obviously you can go further into depth with the gambling side fantasy to be, you know, legally fantasy fantasy relevant it has to be individuals so that's where like the fantasy and sports gambling laws they really have a they overlap but they're not the same so mm -hmm. that's where like that's why you can operate as a fantasy sports you know game as opposed to a sports gambling company couldn't operate in georgia right now right but fantasy obviously can yes so now how'd you guys get into this uh, well, so our CEO, Adam uh, Wexler, who unfortunately has been glow trotting for the past month, can't make it, you know, to this interview. Um, when we uh, when he started the company, it was actually originally a company called SidePrize, which was made to do uh, person to person uh, wagers inside of season long fantasy. So if you and I were in the same league, we could bet against each other, even if we weren't playing each other that so way. So it was like kind of a side league. Exactly. And so mm -hmm. it was called SidePrize. So it was mm -hmm. all about having side bets. And uh, that one was right in 2015. Things were going really well. They won uh, the the uh, elevator pitch award at the uh, fantasy sports trade association and they got accepted so there's to, a fantasy sports trade association yeah there's a fantasy sports <laughs> trade association soon to be the fantasy sports gaming association um but yeah that's uh, been they've been around for at least eight or nine years now they've been making a lot of pushes i mean they've been the ones doing a majority of the lobbying efforts to try to make sure that the at the end of the day that the legal system understands the difference between sports gambling and fantasy sports because mm -hmm. they are two inherently different things. And sometimes people like to clump them in the same as just an overall umbrella of sports gambling, which is But what, what is a negative of lumping them together? Uh, so for perspective, in Pennsylvania, it would be about $50,000 to get a fantasy sports gambling license. To get a sports gambling license, it's $5 million. But what's the difference, like in your eyes, of those two? <laughs> Uh, just the formats at the end of the day. I mean, I think that it's just also the, the player demographics. I mean, people that grew up playing fantasy sports are more, you know, they will gravitate more towards the fantasy side of things. They just want to predict player projections and player performances. They don't care about the whole team dynamic. Whereas traditional sports betting is much more team based as you were doing, you know, just based on over under on the wins or not and how many points a team would score. But do they feel, or whoever makes these rules, do they feel that if you're betting on the team, then you can corrupt and take integrity out of the game? Uh, I mean, in, if you're an NBA referee doing it, yeah, you can absolutely get away so with you that. Can influence, you can influence the game uh, if you're betting on the team or something. But so they view that basically the difference is, yeah, you, they think that with a team-based, uh, you can you basically have people that can influence it. If it's all individual fantasy-based and they're on two different teams, they're on different lineups, they're t it's too hard to basically... I guess uh, influence and outcome exactly influence and outcome when it's 
there, there are too many mixed variables that don't have any correlations to each other. And then part of that, that's why one is $5 million and one's $50,000. Well, they also the expectation of the cost within the marketplace is why they assume that sports gambling is bigger. Because when you look at the European demographics, they have a far larger sports gambling comp, you know audience than they do a fantasy sports audience. So that's where the because of soccer, that's exists. all around soccer. Pretty much, I mean, they have corner bookies. There's there's actually like real like you know brick and mortar companies that are set up next door to each other like you would a blockbuster back in the day versus a Hollywood movie in terms of just there's everyone on on the corner you can go take your bets at for all sports. And then you could bet, bet on the team, win or lose, there. Mm -hmm. But they don't have the fantasy as much as in America? They offer it, but it's just not as prevalent It hasn't there. caught on. Because they have sports gambling, and America hasn't, except for outside right. of Las Vegas and Nevada. We basically have adapted this thing of you know sports fantasy. fantasy sports at the end of the day because of our inability to sports gamble. You and think that's, that's true? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you think that if there was more sports gambling, that could impact the negatively fantasy? Not anymore. I think if it was, if you were talking about in the 90s, I think that's the case, yes, because fantasy hadn't become as prevalent as it is nowadays. But I think everyone, especially from a disposal income demographic growing up, I mean, anyone who's under the age of 40 grew up playing fantasy sports for the right. most part. So And not gambling because it was illegal. Exactly. So we all know player performance better than team performance most right. of the time. So we feel comfortable doing player-based performance stats as opposed to trying to determine team outcomes. So did games like Madden influence the fantasy because you had to kind of know that stuff really specifically in order to be good at that? Absolutely. Madden, I mean, obviously season-long fantasy helps a lot. Uh, I mean, even from that perspective, just having a, a diehard you know, commitment to either a college or a professional team, knowing the types of players that they're picking up, knowing, okay, someone went down with an injury. I know this player is about to be really good who's going to sub in, so I'm going to end up you know, putting him in my lineup or making an entry on him because I think I have value where other people wouldn't know about it. Now, if people are... are kind of fans of the individual more so than the team do you think that in, impacts like going to games and doing some of the other ancillary things around the sport absolutely i mean uh we're obviously working with uh, 680 the fan and 929 here in atlanta just trying to make sure you know we get with the atlanta local sports teams because what we see is that when we end up having teams or players available from you know localized regions where we know we have a lot of users, we see far more action on those players because they you know they want them to do well or they're going against someone else, so they want them to do poorly. So you end up seeing high correlations between overs and unders based on, at the end of the day, fandom. So now, so there is, so you're seeing a correlation between okay, I'm here in Atlanta, so the more Falcons people are chosen because they're more familiar. Like there's ubiquity amongst the information for the local person and maybe they went to university of georgia so they're following them a little more closely than they would somebody who went to washington exactly like you'll see like todd Gurley will end up getting a lot of action on our boards because here have, locally uh here locally i mean obviously well he's LA is a, a big market anomaly, as well but right. i mean but Gurley being from georgia is a big one i mean obviously when we started putting up acuna up last year he got a lot of traction people i mean he was doing really well and everyone was around the hype with him so they played him a lot with our entries and then they like to sometimes go against that. So when Bryce Harper would come to town, a lot of people don't like him. So we'd see a lot of unders on Bryce Harper versus the Braves because they want him to do bad poorly, slash right. expect him to do poorly against right. us. So that would be like the same like Tom Brady here isn't maybe as good as he would be in the Northeast. <sighs> I wish yeah. he could own, go under every time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just because of the inherent bias mm -hmm. locally. And, and then you have to work that into your algorithms? Yes. So that actually, we have to obviously analyze our audience. We have to know who the types of people we're serving. And we do trading. So, I mean, it, at the end of the day, it is just like the other, you know, gambling books that are out there in terms of if we have too much action going over or under and it's weighted one direction, you have to we adjust. will shift lines. Right. Yeah. And then how often do the lines get shifted? Uh, sometimes they cannot get shifted at all. It, sometimes they could get shifted, uh, you know, once or twice, a couple times an hour, depending upon how much action and how steep it was coming in, just to make sure. Obviously, so are humans kind of overseeing the final numbers of, when, of this, or is this just an algorithm that it is what it is? Uh, currently, it's majority human based. We have a few algorithms in place for making the lines originally, but after we've already made the lines, we have basically rules in place to say we won't go too high or too low with our projection sh shifts. But at the end of the day. We have humans monitoring it, and we have obviously uh, bots on the back end that will sometimes send us notifications of, "Hey, you've hit a risk point. You know, you might mm -hmm. need to make a shift now." But still, it would be on us. At the so end of the day. that you just found people that are good at this. 
<laughs> at the end of the day, we found uh, a lot of uh, big time sports fans, somewhat degenerates at times. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah, it's just one big group of us and everyone's kind of like owning their own lane. I mean, obviously, Gorov and I are in the, the marketing side of things. So making sure we're getting our name out there, knowing people know who we are, that we have the right branding available. And then the other guys in house are running the lines baking. And, you know, so do you have specialists else. in baseball, cricket? Like what? What sports are, do you guys? Not do? cricket right. yet. Uh, <laughs> cricket could be a possibility though. I know they had the World Cup coming up. Um, so we have baseball. Obviously, we have MLS covered for soccer. We have football. Would you have had MLS if Atlanta didn't have a team? Not likely, to be honest. Uh, at least not initially. I mean, we had to focus on originally what sports we thought were going to resonate best with. So, are you allowed to do college sports? Yes, in certain states. Not all states are allow college. What sports. about high school? No, definitely not. Oh, that's absurd. That's, yeah, that's abs <laughs> Why would that be absurd? Talk to AAU. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, when it comes to uh, college, yeah, certain states will allow it to be offered. Um, it, that one is the more touchy part. I mean, because some states are very much against it. Some states don't really have a stance on college. So college is the one that's more. So what about what's that league? The Legends League? Uh, the AAF. Yeah. So we actually, we started running that uh, a couple weeks because ago. Because that has an Atlanta team. That has an Atlanta team. Uh, it's got a lot of Georgia players. What about the minor league hockey? Uh, <clears throat> currently we have NHL going, but in terms of minor league yeah. hockey, no. even though there's an, a team here in Gwinnett. Yeah. Even though we have like the, yeah, the gladiators, so unfortunately, no, we don't do minor league hockey. That's more so probably the product of not having good, uh, statistical intel. information. You, yeah. do, you don't have enough intel. Exactly. We need to have the data. We need to have analysis. We need to know that we have, you know, providers that can give us the stream of information. All right. So who'd you bring with you here? So I got Gore with me. He's uh, he's head of brand awareness with our company. So he basically he's the voice of our company when it comes to our social out outreaches and just making sure everyone knows who we are. All right, Gore, what, what's a day in the life of you look like? <laughs> we'll log on to Twitter almost immediately and make sure no one's mad at us. <laughs> so Twitter is well, what, aren't the people half the people who lose aren't they mad at you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, it's really hit or miss. Actually, luckily, uh, our our audience tends to actually be nicer. <laughs> I haven't had too many. Well, because the stakes are lower, right? Yeah. It's not like the guy just lost his house. We have had a <laughs> we have had a few people that will definitely send us five or six messages at two or three o'clock in the morning. But what could they be to... mad at you about? They're the ones who place the really. Wager. We're just a sounding board. We're really just a so. Sounding give me board. an example of somebody's mad at you tweet. I can give you. <laughs> I'll give you an example of one of my favorite times. All right, go okay. for it. Uh, I had a gentleman hit me. Uh, not hit me up. Uh, contact me on customer service because I do it on Sundays between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Okay, that's good uh, to know. He was uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was frustrated because of the outcome of one of his entries the uh, the previous night, and I was like, that's just the that's just how the game right. goes. Like sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and. He was like, oh, I'm not actually complaining about anything. I just wanted someone to talk to. And that's what it comes down to most right. of the times. It's people that are frustrated. They just want a sounding board. Right. They just want to express their frustrations and be heard. Right. That's my favorite on Yelp. The one-star reviews because the restaurant was too crowded. They couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing. They're just yeah. venting. And oh, yeah. they just happen to use your platform and, yeah. and, and hashtag you. To, to exactly. They, ju they want they want mm. to be heard. Right. And so my job is to make sure that they are heard. And we do care about every single user that we have. So now when you're working and trying to create the brand awareness, is some of it to create that community amongst the users where you're trying to get them to kind of like they're all doing this together. We all have this shared passion for this. I mean, and prize it, picks yeah, is the, absolutely. the platform. Everyone for loves every one of our users loves fantasy sports. And it's it's a way for all of them to we actually really encourage it. Now we're on Twitter itself. We're, we're seeing little communities form and people trying to help other people make uh, like succeed against us. So then so you're kind of the, the bad guy in some ways yeah. right like you're the platform where they play on but you're also kind of the one you, they're they want to be you they want to be you yeah. so do you as part of your branding like oh you're the snarky people you're like throwing their face you're i talking try smack. not to there there are definitely times where i want to talk smack <laughs> to some of these so these is people. there a persona prize picks persona i mean at the end of the day what we're trying to be is uh a, a high-end service. Yeah. I mean, we want our clientele to come to us and know that we know who they are. We know everything about them. We know what their teams are. We know who their kids are. We know. But you can't who be unbeatable. No, we can't. I mean, as a house, everyone wants to beat us. So inherently, the but, house is the bad guy. Right, but you can't. You have to win more, isn't that inherent in the house? Oh, yeah. The house always wins, Definitely. right? <laughs> yes. So uh, you have to have that balance of being beatable. That's why we we try and balance it with really really 
good customer support. Right. You know, like Johnny was saying, I actually mailed out a bunch of uh, a bunch of packages last week. I know like the shirt sizes of some of our higher end users, just so they know that even though we do beat them a majority of the time, because that's what we're supposed we, to do. But we want to have that. You want them to have fun. Yeah, exactly. And it has to be a fun experience. Exactly. That win or lose, it was still worth doing. Yeah. Right. Because it's entertainment. It's exactly. not a livelihood. And as Johnny was saying, like, we, um, what's important is we want to make sure that people aren't consumed with our game. And that comes with if we see if we see an individual placing like l large amounts of money and large amounts of entries, we will reach out to them to make sure that they know the best way to win sometimes and to make sure that it doesn't consume their life because we don't want we don't want to create a product that people become like dependent on. We want right. them to have fun playing with us. Right. You don't want to be the cigarette company. Exactly. Yeah, right. not at all. I mean, we had a guy uh, ask us to quickly pay him out because he needed to get his kid a birthday gift. And we're like, you should not be gambling yeah. with your kid's birthday. Like, <laughs> exactly. This is not how you play our game. We really appreciate it, but you should check out maybe not playing anymore. We will analyze. We will analyze the person if we see them kind placing of a lot of risk. entries. Just, right. just to make sure that we don't want that exact thing. We don't want people to have to. Right. Get You're not a high payout. fiving that. Hey, that kid, that guy just risked his kid's birthday exactly. money for you know the Lakers and LeBron doing well. Exactly. Yeah, that was a poor decision. <laughs> if that's the case. So now for you guys, uh, what's next? You're going, you're, you're trying to own your backyard here in Atlanta and you're trying to, I guess, learn how to own other people's backyards, right? By doing this kind of partnering with the sports talk stations and immersing yourself in the community here as best you can. Uh, and then I guess it's rinse and repeat in other markets once you crack the code here. That's essentially what's going on. I mean, yeah, we're trying to figure out what is the proper mix to have within Atlanta itself. I mean, obviously, each region will have its own mix that it requires at the end of the day, but we crack the code here and we can quickly implement that at other places now. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I mean, a couple of big avenues that we're really looking towards is a uh, mainly trying to look fo focus towards the esports side of things. I think it's an underserved marketplace that really is. So dying there's esports fantasy right now, or there is not much. Uh, I think DraftKings offers one version of it for one game, and that's it. And other mm -hmm. than that, there's maybe two other companies out there that are very small that are trying to, but no one's really cracked the code on the esports community. Right. So we're actually going to be partnering up with a uh, high res studios up in Alpharetta right. with their Smite game. So sure. we're going to be running a Smite game for them for their first ever, basically. Uh, pro league uh fantasy daily fantasy uh, partnership so we're going to be creating that and if that goes well then at that point it's kind of like uh you know the, the floodgates are open and the esports community who's trying to find a way into everyone's home will have like this as a good means of actually you know engaging with audiences creating additional content for people right. to talk it's about it's a win-win for the league and you guys everybody wins mm -hmm. when you get more engagement right exactly so now um how did how did well that's kind of lucky in some ways that that happens to be based here in Atlanta. So it's building those relationships with the esports, you know, the popular games. That's part of that's on the roadmap as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the major sports were we're basically ironing out the majority of all of the professional sports here in the US. I think Premier League uh, is definitely in the books for the future. I mean, we we know that that's a great audience and not just, you know, within the US itself, but people that are internationally traveling here and visiting and living here. They love the Premier League more than obviously MLS or most of Jordan. So does MLS it have sports. to be affiliated with professional leagues? Like, could it be the CrossFit Games? Like, could it be yeah. kind of the you know the Ninja Warrior? Like, can it be things that are aren't like the normal? So it but has, they're popular. It would have to be a live recorded event um, to obviously av avoid people cheating, knowing results ahead of time. They right. come in and place in entries because we had actually kicked around doing the Bachelor. Um, right. and doing it based upon over under on, you know, guys making it to certain stages right. or how many roses they would get. Uh, and we were seriously debating and trying to get into that. Then we realized it was a previously recorded and, and it could unfortunately, be game. yeah, people everyone, can game it because the person that was the craft service person might know the answer that. And apparently in the commercials, <laughs> they give away big hints towards the next episode of right. what's actually going to happen. So there's, there's actually too much that is already known about it that we could actually offer a proper game for it, but we had considered it. And it's one of those where, if we feel like we can offer a legitimate game and we feel like there's enough a desire from an audience perspective, then if if we think it's worthwhile, we'll at least give it a shot and see what would happen. So then what's going to be, uh, by the end of this year, what is uh, a result that will get you guys high-fiving in the office? Uh, man, I mean, that's it's tough to say. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's... Uh, 
I mean, obviously hitting a, a final break even point as a company from an operational perspective that we don't have to require, you know, raising any funds because being in a startup as we are right now. So it's self funded right now? Uh, it is. We have a little bit of startup funding, but we haven't gone VC it's just or anything Adam's like that. Adam's wallet? Adam's <laughs> wallet and connections at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, he's he obviously started up another company here in Atlanta called Insight Pool that right. did very well and was bought out eventually uh, by Trinkite. And then Trinkite was ended up bought out by another company, just, you know, one fish eats another fish eats another right. fish kind of a thing. But, uh, so he's he's been making startups now for I guess closer to a decade, and so very familiar with the space, very familiar with you know how to build a company properly. So, right. and this is a fun one. Yeah, you guys yeah. having Absolutely. fun? Absolutely. Oh, every day. It's a joy I, actually to go into the office. Yeah, I yeah, no doubt. I I used to not always enjoy getting up and going to my job, and now it's like I don't even consider it like having to get up and go to my job. I'm literally just getting up to go and hang out with friends and just do work at the end of the day. Now, are you hiring? Uh. Not necessarily in a full-time capacity. I think right now, from a role perspective, we're, we're a little bit maxed out, but we're always looking in terms of like interns and part-time help that in, basically we're still at a, a sweat equity stage. Like from a perspective of bringing people on, we want them to you know invest in the company like everyone else has. Right. So everyone that's coming in is going to be coming in just to prove themselves and at the end of the day, kind of make their own role. Like mm -hmm. I think when Goro first came on, he wasn't even doing what we had him doing. He was helping out mostly with member services. They, and um, I actually applied for one of the positions because I saw it on a on the Atlanta Tech Village job board and they had me in for an interview and they rejected me and they said, we want to bring you on in a different role and they created a job for me. Actually. Uh -huh. So you're looking for talent, but it's just whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then so... Um, do they have to be like kind of a fantasy sports nut to get the job? Definitely helps. It helps. <laughs> uh, there's there's no real thing that says you have to be into fantasy sports. I think having a d general desire and knowledge for sports is a big thing. It's not necessarily a, you have to have it, but it's a nice to have it at the end mm -hmm. of the day. But you're looking for just passionate people to get the job done and to just kind of keep grinding. Exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all startup-based mentality type people. We all know that, you know, you just need to do your work doesn't matter what time of day you want to do it just get it done everyone stays their lane gets things done but at the same time we also cross over and help each other out at any given right. point good stuff so if somebody wanted to learn more or maybe make that first wager where do they go uh so yeah if they want to they can go check out the website which is uh myprizepicks.com or they can download the ios app in the apple store uh we should have the android app done by the end of the month and that'll just be prize picks or they can go to any of our social handles which will be at prize picks on facebook instagram and twitter and the website, though, is MyPrizePicks. Yes, MyPrizePicks.com. Good stuff. Well, thank you both for sharing your story. Thank Thanks you for, for having, having us. All right, hang with us. One more guest. Next up on Atlanta Business Radio, Catherine Morales with Inflection Point Communications. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having Gotta me. Got to jump in there. Got to lean in, <laughs> lean in like you mean it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm taking <laughs> notes from learning everything about fantasy football and all sports. So. How's your fantasy game? Oh, lacking uh, severely. Lacking. I was a little excited about Bachelor, though. <laughs> that, that you could get behind. That I was like, I'm wagering right now. Uh, you got opinions on that. Where do I go? <laughs> so tell us about Inflection Point. How are you serving folks? Um, sure. Yes, I work with entrepreneurs. I believe that a lot of entrepreneurs are thrown in a lot of different directions when it comes to marketing. So I help them to effectively market. I think it's important to save time and money when it comes to marketing. Um, I think a lot of marketing comes down to uh, what's out there, people looking at your business as being the same as others and giving you a cookie cutter plan. And I don't believe that's how businesses work, that they're all different. So I approach it that way. It's personalized marketing. Uh, your tactics and strategies reflect your business. Now, your background isn't necessarily marketing. It's more in the Marcom uh, PR lane. Yeah. So but I have a degree in public relations and I... Have, you came over to the dark side. Well, you know, so when you when I my background is um, working with bigger corporations. So I worked in public affairs affairs in Florida. I moved to Atlanta in 2008 just before the market crashed. Good and, one. So you're, <laughs> yeah, you're really happy shot. about that. <laughs> I well, I love this city. This so I'm was glad such I made a it great in. decision. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. I was working in global firms, and I worked with HP, Sage CRM. Mm. Uh, Bayer Crop Science. I worked with uh, national campaigns for Chick Fil A, and three years ago, I said, "I know there's something more I can do," um, and I decided to take everything I learned from these bigger brands and help entrepreneurs and budding businesses. Uh, what I quickly found is that when you say you do PR, <laughs> most people think that's just media and public, or and yeah, pitching. So media. you're going to get me on the Wall Street Journal. 
<laughs> well, I have before, but uh, no. So I, I definitely have skill sets far beyond that. So I, I do clarify that I did not study marketing in school and certain marketing forecasts I don't do, but I um, am a very, I, I'm a hybrid. I really but, but provide so, more marketing and business guidance to entrepreneurs. But now there's a blurring of the lines. Yes. Whereas maybe when you started out or were in school for PR, there were distinct, there's an advertising track, there's a PR yeah. track. There's a communications track. Yeah. And now with social media, I think there's a blurring of all the lines that it's hard to say where one begins and one ends. Yeah. Yeah. There's more. And that's what's made it more confusing for entrepreneurs because whether it's PR or marketing, I think that's how they segment it. PR is media pitching, um, marketing. Well, there's a whole gamut of things that can fall in right. there. SEO, video firms, right. um, you know, direct mail houses, you name it, events people. I mean, there's so much under the marketing umbrella. So how do you know which one is right? Right. And the and advertising, it, they I guess at some point were the more glamorous one. They're the ones that are making TV shows and things about that yeah. industry. And that's probably now at the bottom of that because nobody wants to pay for ads for things anymore as much. Well, they as, do on social, but everybody's right, taking but, it into their own hands. But they're not running, <laughs> you know, TV commercials and print ads and magazines at the rate that they were. At one point, that was kind of... Yeah. Where everybody wanted to be. Yeah, the Mad Men days. Right. So. <laughs> but now it's not that. It's kind of flipped. No, well, it's it's depends on the business. But yeah, I would say that with the rise of um, citizen journalism, with the blogging, and now I'm sure you saw the podcast. Fe was it Podfest? Podfest uh, Yeah, that podcasting is the thing now. So It's a thing now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you, you all have had the show about 10 years, yes. I understand. and probably you've seen a lot more podcasters in the last Absolutely. few years. When I started, no one knew what a podcast was. They yeah. thought you need an iPod. Yeah. So there's trending marketing strategies and tactics that come right. with time. So, But now do you see this, uh, the advent of everybody is kind of a media channel now? Uh, that's a different mentality of how you would attack somebody's marketing because before there was only a handful of channels to put a person or to put their brand. And now there's... I can go influencer, I can go podcast, I can go video blog, I can go, you know, there's a million places. Yeah, but that places. makes it even more challenging. Right, for, for the entrepreneur, yeah, it's, yeah. Ha it's harder in a lot of ways. Yeah, they, I say one of the things that bothers me the most is that I don't know what day, where it became the norm that the day you become a business owner, you must be on every social channel, you know, right. Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn, Snapchat, Because that's all what of their 18-year-old nephew told them. Yeah, yeah. I'm and then on they Snapchat, get there. Yeah, so I, you should be on Snapchat. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm usually talking to them maybe a year or two mm -hmm. after that, and they're saying, hey, do you write social copy? And I'm like, no, I do social mm -hmm. strategy, but I can help you. <laughs> um, they're, you know, trying to get, and get engagement, trying to get followers. And really, I always look at it when I work with my clients, is that effectively growing your bottom line? That's why I named my company Inflection Point Communications. I think that a lot of business owners are doing a lot of busy work when it comes to marketing, but mm -hmm. they can't draw the dotted line to the ROI. Okay, so you have that hard ROI conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so that's good and bad, right? Now, some people are like, that sounds good for other people, but for me, I really would like to get my followers up. You know, don't they? We call them I cosmetrics. Have... You know, there are certain metrics that sound important around the, you know, when you're hanging out with your buddies, but don't put food on the table. There's, yeah, well, I, I would, I would, I don't think that a lot of business owners are saying, I really want to get my followers up for followers sake. I think you have to want to get your followers up because you're an influencer or because you're running a campaign of some sort, but it always comes back. I mean, I have yet to meet an entrepreneur that says, I don't want leads. I don't need clients or customers. I think that that's what the line has gotten blurred and there's confusion about what social media, what role it plays. And in the end, social is just another channel like media, like, you know, events like direct mail piece. Um, social is a channel to get people to your website, to get to a conversation with you. All right. So let's give some advice to our prize picks folks. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now part of their business, as they said, was this casual uh, fantasy player. Yeah. Are they open to advice? <laughs> they don't care. What do they care? It's free advice, right? You guys don't oh, care. No, yeah, let's, 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 bring let's it talk on. about it. So now how would you attack something like this? It's, I guess, a B2C play, right? This is not B2B. Right. They're going for, it could be anybody. 
So yeah. how would you help them? What would be like kind of the first conversation you would have if you were kind of working with a company like this? Well, I, I really focus on, I, I say there's four points to growing your brand and this is the foundation that everyone needs. And I say, like the game of connect Four. if y'all are familiar with that game, <laughs> yes. it's a solved game. And if you play first, you make all the right moves, you'll always win. So the four points are story message channel audience. Okay. What happens is a lot of businesses start at, I guess, the channels, or they think audience. They say, okay, we have fantasy sports people. That's our audience. Right. Then they say, we got to get on our website. We got to get Facebook. We got to get these Where are channels. they hanging out? Yeah, where are we hanging out? Where are we showing mm-hmm. up? And then they say, now what are we going to say? That's the message. Mm-hmm. But what most every company skips over that's so integral and important for your business is your brand story. What differentiates you? What makes you entirely different than every other fantasy football company or not fantasy sports? It's okay. It's okay. (laughs) Fantasy (laughs) sports company. Um, That is uh, comes down to emotions. That comes down to a feeling. So I guess my first question would be, how would you describe your brand? All right, John, you're on the hot seat. (laughs) Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, or like, what's your why? Yeah, there you go. It's really to offer a. At the end of the day, a high class upscale experience for people that just want to, you know, enjoy the fantasy space. I mean, if for people that are familiar to the daily fantasy side of the business is that the customer support is usually very poor. People aren't really treated like people. They're treated like a number. We want they, anyone that plays with us is called a member and we have member services and they're a member of our personal club. At the end of the day, they're not just a user. There's not a number in our system. So we want people to feel bad. So that's a point of differentiation just by the language you're using. So that's important. That that's kind of those are kind of signals to someone that they're going to get a different experience. Exactly. Yeah, I think when you started to use the word member and you're part of our club. So how does that show up? And where you you said you're on Twitter, but are you on Facebook? What? Oh yeah, we're we're on all of them actually. Yeah. Uh, you know, I try I try and make sure I cater. I try and make sure I cater each and every message. Like I don't like doing. Uh, the the same the post yeah, exactly. I want to yeah. make everything organic. You don't want to sure. be like automated robot. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely times where you have to do that just mm-hmm. because you're trying to reach a, a large audience. But um, I try and make sure every single person is dealt with personally, uh, that they have their own message, that they're, uh, like I said, that they're sound and heard uh, throughout the company and not just me. Yeah. So, so then you get to the why of the organization and then, then you start playing with the other aspects of the connect board. Yeah, so I think the other thing is thinking about um, your ideal customers uh, for your organization and, you know, what people, I always say people buy based on a need or want. Of course, that's self-evident, right? right. But that there's these powerful points. So is it a pain point? Is it a milestone or a moment? When are they looking for you? Your customers might not always be aware that they're looking for you. So it's about being, in, you know, curious enough to discover those powerful points when they might be shopping so, so, so creating kind of ubiquity in the areas uh, where these people hang out is important so that you're there when they need you or want you. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I see it depends on the business, but I, I would imagine that when you all go places, you are going to sporting events or you're showing up to where they are. So um, a lot of businesses, you know, kind of cross think about networking. Oh, I'm going to go network, but they don't think about exactly where they're going. And then they're upset when they walk away without any leads for their business. So I usually find that when businesses are having trouble generating leads and conversions, that it comes down to either they're on the wrong road, meaning they're going to the wrong events, or they have the wrong message. So when they get there, they're not effective enough to convey what their brand. So how do you determine which is which? Well, I I work with them and I ask them, where are you going? I mean, it it would be a further conversation. So one thing I would ask, Ashley, of you all is, um, do you have a Facebook page or a Facebook group? I have a Facebook page. So I would highly recommend a group because of what you said. We want to build a community. What a lot of business owners don't know, and this is what I help with, um, is that actually it used to be when three years ago when I started – a Facebook business page, you would reach organically 13% of your audience. Now, I just checked the latest stats, and it's 6.4%. So that means that you can reach, say, if you have 100 people, you're reaching like six and a half people every time you post, unless you boost that post. So what people don't realize is that social media is a business. And like any business, they want to make money. 
So the reason why a group is better now is because beginning in 2018, Facebook wanted to create more community, and so they encourage group activity. So the algorithm favor, favors groups. Now, that's the current situation. Of course, as soon as a bunch of people do that, they'll start monetizing that. But right now, it's great to be in a group if it makes sense for your business, which I would say it does for you all because you want to create that sense of community. You can do polls. You can engage them. See that? You're welcome. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. <laughs> so now these are the types of conversations people have with you when they're working with you. Yeah, I find that a lot of – when I first started working in the first six months of my business, I started offering PR marketing the same – way anybody else does. I would build a plan. I'd want it, you know, let's implement, let's pitch media, let's do social media and, you know, measure the results. And I found that that was, a, you know, working for folks, but in most cases it was five to 10 steps beyond what most entrepreneurs are looking for initially, that they weren't ready for the plan, that they needed the, you know, at the beginning of the day, your business is about boots or heels, however you want to call it on the ground. You need to know how to show up and where to show up and how to talk about your business. And if you can't do that, then there's no point in doing all the other things. So now if somebody, uh, especially now you're targeting entrepreneurs, which is a different animal than kind of these large enterprises. So they can't afford to make as many mistakes as an enterprise, right? So they have to be right <laughs> sooner. And, you know, the mouse has to get the cheese quicker, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. So now what's a reasonable expectation of seeing a, a result one way or another uh, when they start working with you? Well, I say that you usually should find results within the first 60 to 90 days, mm -hmm. that you're seeing more leads in your business, more conversions. Now, and the your testing hypothesis, right, when you do any of this work. So you, there has to be an element of experimentation. Well, I've been, <laughs> well, I've been doing this a long time. So um, this particular program where the four points I talked about, I call it the Brand Connection Program. I've been offering that officially for since last summer, but I started doing that type of work, working on brand story, working on how you deliver that, where you show up pretty much day one of my business. It was how I, how I decided to work with clients, and it was putting it together into one formal program that really was the difference last year. But when I did that... Um, you know, I had, I sold out of one-on-one -on -one clients in a month and a half. I practice what I preach. So, um, I did a group program that fall and what I've really found is that this is what entrepreneurs need. It's not, Hey, I'll do your social media. Hey, I'll sell you a video. Um, it's how on earth do I differentiate my business when everybody's on all these channels? How do I stand out? So now the work you're doing, is it just from a strategic standpoint where you're saying, okay, you do these 14 things, or is it some of it is like, I do these 14 things for you? Well, um, I call myself an authentic brand strategist, so I really try to stay on the strategy side of things. Um, the majority of my business is consultation. I do strategy work, but I do, do still do some support. And then and that's hands-on. <laughs> so that's hands-on. So yeah. you're, will you be on Twitter answering the tweets? I, well, for my, uh, oh, for, for clients. No, no. So you recommend <laughs> they do it themselves or you have services you partner with? Yeah, I, I have people that I partner with that really, I believe that you should find joy in your business every day. And so I realized several years ago that it didn't bring me a lot of joy to write social posts for everybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, um, so you and I also partners. wasn't willing to, you know, lower my rate for social posts. It just doesn't make sense. It's not conducive for a business, monetarily speaking, for me to do it. Right. Um, but yeah, I find partners. I think when you, what every business owner should know when it comes to social is one, be realistic about your time and what it's going to take to make that channel successful. Um, but two, know what you're willing to do. Are you going to manage it yourself? Are you going to hire somebody? Or are you going to hire an agency? Because those are the three options. And then your option is a consultant that helps them make that decision? Yeah. Yeah. I like to say I'm the guide for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that I, I'm not really, um, I think at first I was calling it a PR counselor, but nobody knew what a PR person <laughs> was. But I, I, it's like therapy for business owners, you know, marketing therapy. You're just getting blasted every day with buy this, do this. And you need SEM, you need SEO, and they just don't know which one is right. So I like to be the sounding board. So now when they work with you, are they working with you for this 90-day period to get it going and then they don't need you anymore? Or is this kind of an ongoing retainer type relationship? No, it depends on the business. They, 
every step of the way, my clients choose how often they work with me. So I do, yes, I have a, a, a group what? program that's five weeks. I have um, one-on-ones, 90 days. I do six-month engagements when it comes to support work, but that's the longest retainer I'll do. Um, I don't believe that business owners need to be so dependent and it's not for me that might not make as much business sense but i don't believe in creating very dependent much like you were saying dependent mm-hmm. relationships that's not a healthy business my job is to empower entrepreneurs to give them a little bit of marketing know-how so that they can navigate that themselves i'll be there when they come back to me next level up um but they don't need somebody on retainer all the time because that's just a drain to your business so now how are you defining entrepreneur what does the ideal profile of a client look like for you well, I don't define it by demographics per se. I don't care how much money your business makes, um, I, so I won't quote on revenue. Um, for me, it's it's there. Are, for I'll speak in terms of the points. So the powerful points that are right for someone to work with me um, when they're starting a business. So get in early. Uh, if they are, I find sometimes that you might be in business a few years and then you want to rebrand. So you want to update your logo or change something. Um, even if you're changing your focus and audience or as you expand to a new sport, that would be a time to, um, cause you can't change your logo. You can't change those things without changing the message. Um, and also if you're finding struggle with your sales or you're in that pain point. So if you've like plateaued or your, yeah. your numbers are down, yeah, it might be worth having a conversation. Yeah. I think that really I find the most ideal time. Of course I help people from the beginning, but I think a lot of times it's necessary to figure some things out on your, your own before you realize, oh, I might need some help with this. So I feel like the sweet spot is three years. I think that I see a natural trajectory for businesses that in the first year you, you know, probably have a reputation in what you do leads and things come pretty easily to your business because you wouldn't have started one if it didn't year two, you might have some referral work, but year three, all of that dries up. It plateaus. Um, and if you don't know how to actually put boots, heels on the ground and build your business and go the right places and do it effectively and for less money, um, then you're going to have a harder time. And you work with B2C and B2B? Yes. And you, you don't have a preference? or No. I've worked with every type of business I've in my career. I think that's one thing that has worked to my advantage. I'm, you know, from... Printer, enterprise printers to smart grid technology for utilities to <laughs> Chick-fil-A sandwiches. So <laughs> I feel I can... Um, but no fantasy sports yet. No. <laughs> no, but you see, I've been able to give some helpful exactly. tips already. So <laughs> so if somebody wanted to learn more and have more substantive conversation, what's the website? It's www.inflectionpoint.com. C-O-M-M-S dot com. Good stuff, Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Lee. All right. This is Lee Cantor for Sanjay Touré. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio. (laughs) 